Hi, welcome to the next episode of Triggers and Spiritual Medicine. I am your host, Laura from Healing with Spirit. And we are here with Crystal. And she's going to be talking to you about what I think. I, first of all, I like bringing in the elephant in the room topics because it's what everybody thinks about. It's what everybody knows, but nobody wants to talk about it. We just shove shit in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. Okay. Um, but she's going to be talking to you about an interesting topic. And especially for those of us who have histories of um, trauma or abuse or mental health issues, um, I should say challenges, that you're going to find the link between that and clutter. <laughs> So this whole podcast, for those who are new, this whole podcast is really about bridging in the intersectionality. I like bringing in, we have a lot of things we talk about, homelessness, we talk about anti-racism, we talk about domestic violence, we talk about addiction, we talk about all these things, you know, obsessive compulsive disorders, all these things, right? But what do they all have in common? Right. And if we can unify and for those of you who may say, well, I don't under, I'm a victim of domestic violence, but I don't understand why anti-racism work matters and what I have and what I experienced or why. Why does? Well, I'm, I have addiction challenges and I don't understand why decluttering my house matters. Right. This is what this whole podcast is really addressing. And so we're bringing in experts and people that have gone through it with amazing stories and. Um, and our, our, one of the episodes we just recorded was actually on somebody reco um, recovering from cancer who came up from a, and it's redefining your life. So it's going to be an interesting, and he wrote a whole play that just got an award in LA. So stay, check out that episode too. But this is what we, we address. It's that intersectionality because those are the hidden things, right? That sometimes we go, oh, but I've done all this work. I've done this, I've done that, right? But maybe it's like, I know from doing domestic violence work, I didn't realize how powerful doing anti-racism work really made a difference on understanding why we have challenges, for instance, why 58,000 children are legally trafficked by way of family court. And why do victims of domestic violence routinely get discriminated against, which then, accounts to incarceration rates, mental illness, homelessness, addiction, all these things. I didn't realize that intersectionality or the intersectionality of homelessness, right? So this is what this podcast is about. So stay tuned. This is going to be powerful. Welcome, Crystal. Please share with the audience what it is you do. How the heck did you start thinking about clutter as like a way of healing? Like what, what's the root? What, what are the triggers that led you here? Um, well, <laughs> uh, that's kind of a life story. Um, right? <laughs> I, I grew up in a, in a super abusive household. My parents divorced when I was eight. Um, they both remarried when I was nine. Uh, my mom married a violently abusive alcoholic and pedophile. And um, my dad married a witch. <laughs> and, and I mean that in the best way possible. Um, old, you know, the real deal. Um, and honestly, she taught me about, she taught me about magic um, and manifesting a different life, right? When you get an, in alignment with the energy of the world. Um, and so that was a big a, a moment for me in my life that, right, I was in this very abusive situation as a minor and completely without options, without choices. Um, you know, my, my dad filed for custody. My mom lied. Uh, my dad lost, you know, they took me to a psychiatrist and also lied to them and told them I wouldn't stop lying about being abused. And, and so there was a lot of stuff in there for me that I was really trying to escape from, from a very young age. For me, one of those ways that I escaped was in <laughs> rearranging my room, right? Trying to create a safe space in my own room. Um, and I spent a lot of time playing with Barbie's dream house, <laughs> ah. rearranging her space. Um, I don't know. It, interior design was always sort of just a thing for me. It was just 
a, a thing that I did growing up, even like as a teenager, right? I was that person. Um, so as an adult, I went to school. When I got older, right, I sort of had this vision for what I wanted of my life. You know, I'd always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, I always wanted to have some big, amazing, wonderful life, you know, where I mattered and I made a difference. Um, but when I grew up, I, I didn't have any of that, right? I was pretty miserable in my life. Um, I had one abusive relationship after another, and I sort of felt like I was, I was never going to have the life that I wanted or that I was dreaming of. Um, and finally, at one point, I just had to sit down with myself and, and be like, okay, Crystal, like, maybe you need to do something about you, <laughs> right? Like, you know, there's, and so I, I started on this sort of personal development journey. Um, it was partly triggered at that time by a, a mentor that I had in, in a business that I started. Um, and he introduced me to more of like personal development work, right? Going to workshops and seminars and obviously traditional therapy did not feel safe for me. So and I my can healing... say traditional therapy <laughs> doesn't, well, cause yeah, traditional therapy. I mean, they're not taught trauma unless you actually go and you take it. So, cause it's, it's driven on a very, this is the intersectionality piece. It's driven on a very <laughs> white male supremacy model. <laughs> yes. Right. And, and it's based on, I mean, all of medicine, all of medicine is based on oppressing women, right? Because back when we were a matriarchal society, women were in charge of the healing and the medicine and all of that. And, you know, when the men decided we're taking that power away from them, that's when they developed the American Medical Association. And of course, psychiatry is a part of that. But so, they also, they also I must add, <laughs> they, they murdered, because I, uh, I think it's episode six, I interviewed a friend of mine who was healing. This is how the intersectionality happens, because she was yes. going through <laughs> breast cancer, healing that and healing the roots and looking at like the generational stuff and saying like, mm. you know, her ancestors were slave traders. So then connecting it to the burning times of witches. Yes. And we talked, we did a whole episode on how, how, um, what is it? How the burning times of witches influence white women culture today. So, and it's yes. profound because we don't talk about the genocide of 9 million women. Yes. I just on was religion. talking about that on my on social religion. media just the <laughs> other day after this Roe v. Wade thing, when they, when they, you know, overturned Roe, I was literally just talking about the last, the last time there was a war on women um, and the numbers range, right? And it, from yeah. 2 million to 9 million, I've mostly have heard around 7 million, which was the number I had put out there, right? Saying like 7 million women died the last time there was a war on women. How many are going to die? I mean, die it, 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 regardless of the number, <laughs> we're talking millions of women, right? Millions I mean, of women. Millions yes. of women. And, and, and what we're faced with, and I just heard, if I'm not mistaken, that I, I'm not even going to put it out there because I want to verify it first, <laughs> but because it's pretty challenging. And, um, but we are facing really, you know, it, it's, it's, it's paradoxical because on one hand, we have a huge opportunity for the first time in hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Women have, have falsely thought that they have been free. But like, as I've, I've, we've talked in previous episodes, women, like I remember, OK, if you're under 40, you're not going to probably appreciate that those who are listening. But I had to get my first and I go, maybe this is showing my age. Like I remember when I was in my 20s going like, well, they don't know what they're talking about. Right. <laughs> but I remember getting my first checking account and needing a cosigner because I was a female. I remember getting my first credit card and needing a cosigner because I was female. I had to get my first mortgage not because of anything else, but because I was a single female and the mortgage broker flat out told me if I was married, I would have had no problem with, with all the, all what I gave them. But because I was a single female, I needed a cosigner. Yep. You and I are the same age. I have some of the same memories. Yes. Um, of know? being younger. And but we need to talk about this because this is what is being threatened. And there are too many women that like I just, I just was a guest on somebody else's podcast, and we even talked about the 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 uh, Johnny Depp trial because if we keep 
putting out memes, trashing victims of domestic violence. We are supporting white male supremacy. Yep. Yep. We are. And um, all of that, right? All of this is about white male supremacy. Um, and that was a big, and I grew up in that, right? Yeah. My, my whole family is super racist, super, um, I mean, they used to tell me all the time growing up that I was too dark when I was born. So they had to soak me in milk to make me an acceptable color. Wow. Right. And I mean, they said it as a joke and I get yeah, that. But is it really? Had, but is no, it really? Well, and that's the thing. I never had, uh, not that I, I never really had doubts that my family loved me growing up. But then as I got older and I look back on it and I'm like, no, no, that's not, that's not what love is. You don't. I mean, I hated my skin color growing up for, for huge portions of my life. I was um, on the receiving end of racist comments always, you know, um, the constant, what are you? Mm. Like worded in that way, what are you? Because people look at me and they cannot quite put their finger on what my nationality is. And it's it took me decades to figure yeah. out how racist it was. You know, white people will look at me and say, ask me, and sometimes they'll, they'll couch it in this very, oh, you're so exotic and beautiful. Where are you from? Yeah. You know, even though I'm white, my children are not. And so I remember, and my middle daughter is the darkest out of my three, out of my three children. So she has more of the coloring of her dad, who was from Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember walking in the malls when she was like two and three and I'd be holding her hand and, and the looks that I would get from white folk, like, why does she have a dark skinned baby? You know, like those kind of looks like, and, and like, like she wasn't mine. And, yeah. and it was like, wow, like it was so apparent. And, and they don't even think they're doing anything wrong. They really well, in my whole life, my grandmother would talk about, because my grandmother was married twice, right? She would talk about her first husband mm -hmm. um, being dark and how she loved his dark, beautiful skin. And she wanted dark, beautiful babies. But she would always adamant that he was white. He was French and he's white. But she always told my sister he was French Canadian. So there's always been a big mystery, even in my family, about what nationality I am. And it was in 2020 that I went home to see my family for the first time since 1994 wow. and had several conversations with my, yeah, that's how brutal my family is. I don't, I ran away at 20 ish years of age with two children and went out on my own and left my tribe and like risk certain death, right? That's like caveman stuff. You do not walk away from your tribe. It means death. For me, yeah. it was safer for me to walk away from my family. I think it is for a lot of us. And I think if us women can understand the courage and strength it takes to do that, and instead of throwing derogatory comments to try to belittle women who do that, you know, like I was watching a thing about Boris Johnson, who just resigned, you know, and his history of you know, demeaning um, women, you know, mm -hmm. and, and like, especially single mothers, you know, like they were, you know, evil. <laughs> right, but we're all taught that way. Well, and too, that's the same, like single mothers are, are belittled for being the parent who stayed just like daughters are belittled for having daddy issues when it's the fathers who failed miserably at parenting. So yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's just, we are trained as a society from birth, no matter what gender you are to, you know, uh, oppress and abuse women. And it goes back to, well, it really goes back to three, well, 300 AD, if Constantine, we can really pinpoint that date. Yeah. But I mean, it was before that too, right? Always trying to strip power from women. So my, my, my thing has always been about empowering women ever since I was little, right? I looked my mother in the eye at eight years old and was like, I will never be anything like you, right? I am going to empower women. I'm not here to strip their power. Um, and so I went on that healing journey to face all of my own trauma as I was trying to like build a life. Right. So kind of, it was two sort of parallel things, right? I was building a business and trying to really find my passion and my purpose 
Um, and I was healing from all of that sort of trauma. And I had a whole bunch of intersectionality there too, where it was just all these dots kind of connecting for me. And so what, so how did you go from like, what was the, what was the triggering moment, right? That made you decide, geez, you know, I, I had this experience. I, I, and, and what I've had to do to overcome all that in my own life to, I want to help women declutter their lives. <laughs> like, how did you come up with the connection to clutter? What was that triggering moment? I think it was kind of a series of them, really. Because as I started to become an interior designer, first, it was in my psychology class that I had to write a psychology paper related to my field of study. And I, at the time I had heard about feng shui, I knew it was related to the flow of energy um, and, 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 and how that works, but I didn't know enough about it. Right. And so I took the opportunity in for that assignment, right. I, cause I was a single mom working full-time and going to school full-time. I didn't have a lot of free time to just study for fun. Um, I took that assignment and I studied feng shui. I studied the psychology of it. I didn't just study like the flow of energy or how to do the space. I really came at it from this different perspective, right? This perspective of the psychology. And so I looked at it very differently. And if we fast forward a few years as I'm working in my career, um, I actually had just started my my dream job. And my boss pulled us all together <laughs> for an emergency meeting because a client had rejected the design plans um, for their project because the feng shui was all wrong. Mm -hmm. These were international clients from China. They were familiar with, um, with feng shui and they rejected this multi-million dollar project. And my boss pulled all of us together, like who can help? Who knows anything about feng shui? She was in a full-blown panic, right? And I was the only person to raise my hand and, and volunteer. Wow. And I sort of got thrown this project and said, fix this. <laughs> um, nothing like just getting thrown under the bus. Here, it's my first week on my brand new job, right? I'm trying to impress my boss. And I get tossed this million dollar project and said, here, fix it. Um, and huge imposter syndrome moment, but it also, I really fell in love with the doing it, right? The combining the things. And so I started taking on my own clients, like on the side, just for feng shui. I was farther along in my healing journey. I was actually working on healing my relationship with men at that time. And I was in a group of about 50 women who were all learning to find love again. And um, I had offered to just help them feng shui their place, like to, to bring that in, right. To shift the energy and to bring that all in. And every one of them without fail got stuck in decluttering. I did call after call after call talking with them and they all got stuck in just why they couldn't declutter. And so I went back to the books of reading more and more about clutter, what I could more about the psychology and just listening to the words. And I was kind of coaching them through, you know, like the, the process. And I realized I was really like giving them therapy, right? It was like coaching them through not just decluttering the stuff, but also those stories of why, you know, what, what was it? And it really led me into this path of, of studying the clutter and study and really learning more about it. And, um, and developing my own system for how we really read it because I noticed all these patterns. And, and what I was finding is it was, it we talk about clutter a little bit in feng shui and how it stagnates the energy of the space from flowing freely. And therefore it also stagnates your life from flowing freely and creating the results that you want. But that's like, as far as feng shui teachings go with clutter, there is nothing else. And so when I started really diving into this clutter, right, because I was on this journey, these women were on this journey, and I was just trying to, and I really started digging into the psychology part. It was 
it really relates to the mindset pieces, um, right? The scarcity stuff, the worthiness stuff, the obligation stuff that we've all been taught from when we were super little, right? About whatever, those things. And then how it reflects in our environment like a mirror to just keep reinforcing those same beliefs around our worth and our what we're obligated, all the things that keep us from, from playing small and keep us in this little tiny box that we were forced in. Um, and I, everything was going great, right? And my business was growing and I was helping all these women and I, I was still working, right? Full-time and my business was like part-time, but it was really taking off. I was living in Hawaii. Um, most of my clients were like on the East coast and in Australia. And so I had all this time different stuff that was impacting me. So I ended up moving back to the mainland um, and starting a different job while my business was growing. And I got hurt at this job, like workman's comp injury that put me in a wheelchair for, well, put me in bed, really. I never got a wheelchair. I couldn't get a doctor. Um, so I had to fight with these insurance people for, you know, three years to, you know, to prove that I wasn't lying, to prove that I was actually injured, to prove that I needed surgery to repair the tendon that was torn. Um, and all of that put me in bed for close to three years, unable to walk. And my place for the first time in my life got cluttered. I'd never experienced that. Sort of, I was always really good about decluttering, right? But one of the things you have to remember is I was the throwaway kid, right? When I told my mom, your boyfriend, I mean, I didn't know the word pedophile, but I knew the word abusive and I knew the word, you know, horrible. I knew all sorts of words to describe what he was. When I told her that when I was eight, right? And her response was to call me a liar. And from there on out, pretty much both of them were, well, I hate you and I would get rid of you if I could, but not to so your dad, it, because I don't want you to be happy, <laughs> you it's know? So it's so, <laughs> you know, listening to your story, what really kind of hit home is like that pivotal moment. It's because like when we're abused by the individual, that's clear, right? Mm -hmm. We're abused by the system that we're told is supposed to help us get better then like, cause I'm hearing like you went through this and you were in bed for three years and all you're saying is like, just please help me. And right. instead you, you were re-traumatized and re-abused by the very system that was supposed to help you. Yeah. And you know, like on my end, I had the same thing. Like, you know, I talk in my, in the two books that I wrote, you know, um, you know, about how I, I grew up in, a, in an abusive home, how I was sexually abducted at 12, how I was, I lost, I was raped at 15 and which kind of led to this whole thing of like where I married my, my abuser. And throughout that time, I never sought help. And many times I didn't even talk about those abuses until I was, I was advised by a friend of mine who saw bruises on my face and, and was on a call to help me say, you need to get a restraining order. And that started the chain of me going to the system, asking for help to then losing custody of my kids and not seeing them now for 11 years. That right. was my punishment for going to the system for help. Right. And, all, and that's actually when I developed complex PTSD. I was functional, even if I had PTSD beforehand, like I was so looking at that now, like, was I just high, highly functioning, you know? And I think I was because I was, mm -hmm. I was, I was that ultra independent, they call it trauma drive. You yeah, know, I so, have the same thing. Complex trauma, right? Super, super independent, very self-sufficient. So it's a strong indicator of trauma. I wrote my first, first book when I was 11. Oh, there you um, go. My book was <laughs> about a cheerleader getting gangbanged by a football team. Oh, wow. And my mother found it. And of course, it was vile and disgusting and clear evidence that I was being molested. But she wanted to blame it on my father, not my stepfather, my biological father, and tried to use that as a way to keep me away from him. 
because he was the one fighting for custody and trying to get me out of that situation, me and my sisters. Um, oh yeah, I was ridiculed and shamed for having written this book and how vile and my mom is a super Bible thumper just for, um, just for reference. Um, and so, yeah, we religiously read the Bible every night. And so what I wrote in her mind That's so was very patriarchal vile and right? disgusting and mm. clear evidence of my abuse. But we don't do anything about the abuse. We just shame me for writing it. Because that's so, the that's that's the Christian supremacist mm-hmm. model. Absolutely. Is is like we are taught that we are born impure, we are born mm-hmm. of sin. And yes. we have to spend all the rest of our lives repenting our sins. And don't forget, honor your parents. And, and this, you're obligated to do all these, you know, b- obey them and be this perfect child for them. So, of course, for decades, for most of my life, the worst thing I would say about my parents is they're not very nice people. My mother is a malignant narcissist and a sociopath. Um, my stepfather is a pedophile, an alcoholic, and... Mm also a sociopath. Um, They're both violently abusive and but they like to portray, oh, and victim parenting. My mother is an expert at that, but they like to portray these wonderful Christian, saintly, saintly But that's that's the mask. That's the mask. (laughs) That's totally the mask. Yes, absolutely. So, So tell me like, you know, like here you are lying in this bed, right? And you're recognizing that for the first time in your life, you're going, holy shit. My house is cluttered because I went through the same thing. Like when I was trying to leave my my ex husband and my abuse, my abuser. I mean, when I was dealing with the abuse, I mean, I took care of the house. I had two acres of land. I painted. I did all the physical repairs. I was cutting down with chainsaws and and <laughs> all I that. I was chopping wood with an while, axe. So I while feel you. <laughs> literally m- taking care of three kids. Okay, mm-hmm. and my house was spotless. But the mm-hmm. minute I was dealt with a systemic abuse. And the retaliation from the system, mm-hmm. all of a sudden, I found myself in clutter. Yeah, I mine was still kind of hidden, right? I couldn't move very well, right? I could walk basically from my bed to my toilet or to my chair, but and my my focus was still. I have to build this business. I have to build this business because I have to be able to support myself and take care of myself. And I'm on my own, and nobody's ever going to care. Um, yeah, about this, and, that, whole and that's situation. a real trauma trigger, right? I mean, that's yeah. a real a lot I of us might never because, walk again, right. and yet nobody seems to give a shit. And I because, got pissed. Yeah. yeah, I got pissed, and I was like, "I'm, I'm gonna do this." So I, I focus on my business, right? Still, kind of not doing much for myself, but just plowing through. Of I'm gonna push through anything and everything. Um, but most of my clutter was still in like hidden, right? I had a box full of, I remember having a box full of mail, right? Because the insurance people send you everything in triplicate. Mm. And then I had stuff from my lawyer and stuff from all of these in the insurance people. Cause I ended up with two workman's comp injuries, right? Because they forced me back to work after my first one, which caused a second one. So I had two separate cases going with two separate insurance companies over two that happened 11 months apart all of which was going on. Um, And it just so happened that I went to an event with a business coach. I could barely walk. Um, And I pushed my way through that whole thing. And at the end of that event, she threw down this challenge to the whole group of whatever, a hundred people in the room um, about sort of really about shifting energy and building momentum, right? And her challenge was to get on video for 30 days, right? Because everybody in there was an entrepreneur trying to build momentum in their company and be seen. She was like, get on video for 30 days and just talk to people. It'll help you get over the comfort, discomfort of being on camera. And I did the first day and I was just like, Ugh, stupid, waste of time, nothing. And I was like, I'm not gonna do this. This is dumber than shit. I'm not just gonna waste 30 days of garbage just just so I can be on camera. So I went home and I was like, all right, if I'm going to do 30 days of something, I'm going to make it worthwhile, right? So I came up with this plan of doing 30 days 
it was, it was, this was very end of April. So I was like, for the month of May, I'm going to do this 30 days of decluttering thing for people, a challenge, right? For people that are on my social media. And every day I did one thing that was like 10 minutes or less of decluttering. And I got to that box and I, <laughs> I am. Um, I had a shredder, right, to shred all this paper. Um, and I wound up with, you know, those grocery store bags, the plastic ones. So they're, you know what size they are, right? It's kind yep. of like perfect for the bathroom trash. Right. I wound up with 11 of those packed full to the brim with shredded paper. It was just in my office space, right? All of that was just letters from lawyers and, and insurance people. I mean, in addition to all the other clutter, but yeah, it took me three days to sort just the paper to get that out of my space. Right. Um, and so it started, but it started shifting things because I was doing just a little bit at a time in a way that I had not ever really done before. I'd always been like, we're doing massive declutterings. We're going to go do all the rooms, kids, come on. You do your room, you do your room. I got the rest of the house, right? We would do it three times a year. I was always decluttering. Never had I taken a whole month to declutter like one thing at a time. Today we're doing the fridge. Today we're doing the bathroom. Today we're doing this. And energetically, I was able to notice like such a huge shift in my space and in, you know, as I was talking my way through each one to these people on the other side of the camera, it was like, I was finally coaching myself in a way that I had been coaching clients for years and something clicked like very different. And I just started applying it differently and started listening to things differently. And my, I began this whole big clutter journey of, of really digging into it and, and telling my story, not no more, just my parents aren't nice people. No, right. my parents are monsters. They are heinous individuals, right. That belong on a crime show, right. Based on a true story. Yep. Here I am. Uh, and so when I was finally able to really start it's amazing what honest. happens when we can be honest with our story, especially you like, you know, like in my case, I grew up was, which I talk about in my, in one of the books about, you know, the domestic abuse I grew up with. I never talked about it because I saw my dad, for instance, who literally put a gasoline tank in my living room. So he's going to blow us up and blow everybody else up in it type of shit. Right. But Nobody I ever saw, believed me. Everybody just called right, me a liar. But I, mean, so, yeah. but I think the best thing he did was to leave, like my parents is split mm -hmm. because they were so volatile for each other. And I watched him trying to change, you know, and he started owning. And I think even for men who may have been abusive, but may not be abusers. I think there's a difference here, right? Um, for men that can be abusive, owning that there's power there being being a victim and still love your parents and still tell your story because they still have to own their stuff too right and it doesn't mean you shame them right it just means it is it's your story there's power there you know and um because i had challenges like how do i what do i even want to put this in the book because my dad was a wonderful human in the end you know so, um, you know, do I want people to judge him for who he was for those years, you know? Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's amazing what happens and how free we can be when we can start actually not hiding from shame, the stories that are within us, right? It's crazy. Right. And I had, I mean, decades of shame because that was my parents' favorite weapon, shame. To be ashamed of yourself for, anything and everything. You should be ashamed. You should be ashamed. You should be ashamed. And so I always was carried around this. I should be ashamed of being abused. Like it was my fault. Like there was something inherently wrong with me that I just, and my brother still believes that, right? I had a conversation with my brother a few years ago. He still believes that my parents still have him absolutely convinced that he deserved all the punishment. And even when he wanted to go to therapy, they talked, they were like, eh, don't, don't worry about the root cause of it. Just worry about anger management right now. And I'm like, yeah. 
of course they don't want you to get to the root cause of it. They are the root cause of it. Yeah. But they won't, you know, but they don't, you know, they don't make efforts to change so, no matter how much I've tried to ask them to. So you've worked with hundreds of people, hundreds of women who may have had similar stories and, and challenges with decluttering. What are some of the common things that you feel? What are some of the root issues that you find that you that you see as what causes this challenge of decluttering in women? Um, well, it's it's what the clutter is, right? The clutter is just a mirror of of the mindset, right? It's a reflection of the things that we believe. And a lot of people don't necessarily understand what clutter is. A lot of things, when we talk about clutter, a lot of people in their mind get this idea that we're talking about trash. Yeah, we're not talking like being like, because my, my mother became a pack rat as a result of her dementia. <laughs> and we're not talking about that. Yeah. Your house, I, I mean, I have clients that have come to me as self-proclaimed minimalists whose house is impeccably spotless and they still have clutter. Yeah. You know, clutter is, is, is the, is that, um, insidious thing that hides in plain sight everywhere to just continually to reflect to us those beliefs that we've been taught. So a lot of things are around, the biggest one is always around worthiness, worthiness and obligation. Those are the two things that I see frequently that keep women playing small, especially entrepreneurs, right? When they want to have a business, but they don't feel worthy of, of receiving the goodness or of having the thing that they want. And so there's always a lot of, of clutter that reflects those beliefs um, and scarcity. We all are so many of us really, even super wealthy people. I mean, I have clients that are six and seven figure business owners and they still will have at least moments of scarcity because that's a systemic thing too that we run into, right? It's systemic and it's part of the, it, I mean, it's intentionally part of the system, right? The system yeah. wants us to be poor. It teaches us how to be poor. It teaches us nothing about money. And so facing all of those things as well, um, and the scarcity trauma that is also generational that right. goes back from um, all of those things. And so um, we, I really approach clutter in a very different way when I talk about clutter, um, especially with my clients and what we look at it because it's a tool. It's really a tool to be able to read the barometer of where you are right now, right? Because even as we declutter our current stuff, right? Even in the work that I do, right? As we declutter our physical, mental, and emotional stuff currently and face it, not fake it till you make it, but actually face our clutter and dive into it and really use it to to re, to heal that story and to and to release that trauma it's it's like anything else right it's sort of this upward spiral right you might get rid of one old story but you still got to dig down deeper into the next one and the next one and the next one and since we are as humans are hardwired to acquire and purchase and buy things um you're always going to have clutter. You're always going to uh, be growing into the next level version of yourself. Therefore, you're always going to continue to have clutter that you need to release so that you can have room to become that next version of you. So how do you decipher? Like, you know, like I, like I, I know you talked earlier, like in the beginning of this, right? Because I'm going through a big transition in my life and and, you know, with, with the passing of my dad and we shared a house and an office together and, and I'm going from like five, almost 5,500 square feet between office and home to, you know, like 1,000, 1,500 square feet type of thing. And I walked into my kid's closet that I haven't seen in 10 years. And, and, and I, and I, and I, and I kind of laugh at myself because I know that it is a PTSD trigger. It is, it is an avoidance factor. How do you coach those that might have those like similar things? Because it's that fear. It's that, it's that avoidance, you know, like I can't do this. Like, you know, I, like, I know for me, I'm like, I just need to hire somebody to do it for me. 
<laughs> right? So like, you know, how, like, how do you decipher, especially if you're going from like one to the next and you know the next phase is gonna be amazing, right? How do you actually decipher what to get rid of and not? Well, I have a very specific decluttering method. First of all, that's okay. unlike everybody else is out there, to be honest. Um, and it's a five-step process that really does take you through, not just going straight from discovering, this is my clutter, oh, let me get rid of it, but actually going through the, through the, the magic of, of, of the process. Um, so the first two steps are really about discovering and diagnosing your clutter, right? You've got to You've got to look at it. If you don't love it, use it, or need it, it's clutter, period. And with the rampant consumerism, which is also systemic um, in our, and I'm a capitalist. I am all for capitalism, but the capitalist- I'm, I'm a recyclist. <laughs> but I mean, I'm in business. Yeah. I, 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 everybody who's in business is a capitalist, but this right. very, very disgusting- capitalist thing that has been happening on in this patriarchal society of you know, sell a bunch of garbage for overtriced stuff that you can constantly be, you know, we have to make more profits and more price. Nothing we're about the people or about the planet, right? We've got to shift all of that. And I totally lost the train of thought of where I was when I went out. So you were saying candidate. like you have like a, mm. uh, you, you have, you have a two-step pro like the first two steps is a like a process. process. But yeah. Yeah. Um, because we are constantly, you know, we have to really diagnose what it is so we can dive deep into that, that journey. So like, you know, if you can walk somebody through some of that, because what I'm, what I'm trying to like help folks understand who might say, okay, but I've heard this maybe, you know, like I use some of them recondo, you know, and <laughs> You know, so, well, I kind of get, I kind of can relate to some of her stuff because I'm trained in some Japanese therapies. So I see, I know the Shinto mindset behind that, mm -hmm. but, um, you know. But the so thing is when you focus only on, there's two things, right? There's right. two sides of the clutter coin, right. right? There's clutter and there's everything else that's not clutter. All the things that spark joy, all the things that you love. When you focus here only on these, these things that you love, um, you don't get into the magic that decluttering offers you by listening to what your clutter is telling you about why you're stuck right here. Okay, so that brings me to, when you just said that, what if is it the things that bring you joy are the things that are the clutter those are not but the things well because i could go into i've got memories with my kids i've got this that my grandmother made and, and every time i look at it, it brings me joy right i got a beautiful organ that's from the 1800s that i would love to take right but i just can't that was my grandfather's you know so like those bring me joy but the other stuff that brings me magic are things because of what I do for my work, but I need to be able to create space, right? So it's a limited space and you have too, much, you have too much stuff that actually brings you joy. Right, yes. And that's, it's just like your time, right? It's a trade-off, right? You, you, have, you have to make choices between you right. know, the space and what brings you the most joy. Right. Cause yes, it's great that you have this, you know, like this organ that brings you memories, right. And the memories are joyful, but it doesn't actively bring you joy right now in the moment. It just brings you joy when you look at it. So it could bring you just as much joy to have a picture of it or have a picture of like your grandfather playing it, hanging on the wall, taking up a whole lot less space because right. you're not the one playing it. You're not, you know what I mean? It's not the same it's not the same type of joy. So you really have to look at what is, and that's why I have this whole system that I developed. And I like to, can I, can I give it? Absolutely. Because I like to just give this away for free to people um, because I feel like it is so helpful with how I approach 
decluttering. Um, you can download it for free at declutteryourmindset.com and that'll walk you through these five steps. Um, I don't know what I was going to say next. <laughs> so yeah, so like, you know, it is a mindset, right? Because what if, you know, like in my situation is, for the most part is, I got too many things that I love and I'm having a hard time discerning what to keep and what not to keep, especially since like some of the stuff isn't what I see as replaceable, right? I think this is where the magic of steps two, three, and four really happen because mm -hmm. you're stuck here. You're yeah. stuck here in this spot. And this is where everybody who comes to me gets stuck, right? right. They might've already tried these other methods. They've probably already tried Marie Kondo's method, but they have these things. And a lot of them will get rid of, you know, 80, 90% of their clutter. But when they get to these last few things, right? those are the things that are the problem. And those are the things that you can't solve by focusing on the not clutter. You have to listen to what your clutter is telling you to understand why you are so stuck and why you can't make that choice about which one to let go of. So if we're talking about, you know, since I know we both come from like tra you know, traumatic backgrounds and, and I'm gonna presume that a lot of people that might be listening to this might also come from maybe mothers who lost custody of their children, for instance, right? Or maybe mothers whose children overdosed and they lost them that way, right? What would you say to those that may be stuck in the grief cycle? <sighs> That's a hard place to be. Um, I have not lost a child, thankfully. Um, my stepmother, the, the woman who was my savior and my hero in my journey um, as a child, um, and who was the first person that I turned to as an example of how to be after I told my mother to that I would never be like her. Um, she passed away when I was 15, very quickly, um, very tragically, right? We found out she had I think it was stage four throat cancer and she was dead within a few months. Um, and of course I wasn't allowed to go. I wasn't allowed to be present for the end stages, right? The stages of after she was diagnosed until she died, when she went through the finding myself sort mm -hmm. of stages of dying, I wasn't allowed to go. Um, I, I, I was forbidden actually from even really speaking to them. So after she passed, um, my, um, and my father has always had a lot of heart, heart problems as well. So when she was sick, my father was also in the heart, in the hospital for several heart attacks and a bypass surgery. <laughs> so after she passed away, he was sort of recovering from bypass surgery and, um, because they lived in the house that she owned before they were married. Um, when she passed away, her daughter inherited. And so my father had to move and literally took, it was sort of the same thing, right? He had all of her belongings and all of his stuff went from a big house to a small house and just, it was all just there and he couldn't face it either. Um, and was still in the grief and still in, I think the trauma of his own health problems, right? After losing his wife and his own health. Um, and so when I was 18, um, cause she passed when I was 15, when I was 18, I moved back across the country to go live with my father and go through all of her belongings. And as hard as it is to do, it can be a very cathartic thing to go through. Um, and allow yourself to heal from that trauma. You, losing someone who is so important in your life, whether it be a child or a parent um, or anyone that close to you, um, I, I almost feel like going through their stuff and 
sorting through all of it is one of the most cathartic and healing things that you can do. It allows you to not just release their physical things, but it allows you to release some of the heaviness that you are carrying. Um, it allows you to process, right? It does allow you to process. Um, and that is partly what my method does. It allows you to process your own stuff. And so it also allows you to process the stuff that belongs to other people, you know, like the emotions of the stuff, because a lot of that is what it is. A lot of clients come to me with even things that they've inherited from people um, that they have a hard time with decluttering. Um, and a lot of that is around obligation. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. And that's why you cannot just focus on the physical clutter. If you do that, you don't get the healing out of it and you don't get the processing out of it. When you focus on the clutter and you really dive in. Can you really though clutter your space without cluttering your mind? Without decluttering? I can't, and no, I, clutter I, is a reflection of your mind. Right. So you don't, like... clutter up your, <laughs> you don't clutter up your mind because your space is cluttered. Your space is cluttered because your mind is cluttered. And that is where a lot of people get it backwards. They think we, that we are a reflection of our environment. And we are to some degree, right? You're a reflection of the environment you grew up in. Mm -hmm. But now you are reflecting it into your current environment. And it is mirroring that back to you constantly, which is why you really have to focus on the clutter and why you have to really dive in to understanding it, to listening to it, and to processing it so that you can release it and move on. So if you could share with me like three tips for those, whoever's listening could take with them today to learn to declutter, like what are some of the things they can do today to start that decluttering process? Well, first download my method because you're going to need this to go through it with, but there's a couple of things that will also make it easier for you, right? It's mm -hmm. first it helps if you understand that, that your space is a reflection of you. So it's a relationship with yourself. This is about your relationship with yourself and not about cleaning your house. Um, and then, you know, if you just, it helps if you start small. Even if you just do a timer for like 15 minutes a day and just start a little bit, as you start to shift small pieces of the clutter and the energy, you will start to build that momentum and you'll be able to get through more of it at a time. But one of the things that really helps and makes it easier, especially when you are dealing with some of these very traumatic things, like the example that you gave, going through your children's things. It helps if you can actually create a degree of separation between you and your stuff. Um, so taking pictures and decluttering from the picture instead of like from the space, right? So take pictures of it, sit down, look at it, go through it, and you can be in your mind like, oh, okay, I know these five things are clutter. So all I just need to do is go in and grab those five things from the picture out of the space, right? You don't have that emotional connection anymore and it does make it a little bit easier. Um, I do have quite a few videos where I talk about the, the sentimental things and decluttering that. I focus on that a lot with my clients um, and then even some of my That's videos where I on see, YouTube. That's where I see some of the clutter. It's it's not the things, I think it's easy to discard the, the things that really don't have value. It's being able to part with the things that do hold value. Yeah, yeah. And especially because we don't, sometimes we have to look at the value. That's exactly what it is. Where did that value come from? Is it real? Is it something that was put on you? Um, is it does it matter as much as something else? Like, so these are deep conversations that I go in. And that is, um, that is really what decluttering is about. It's not just, this makes me happy, yeah. but what, you know, and this sparks joy. This is like this, we are creating a space 
where everywhere you look is, you know, something that you love. And that is reflecting not who you were, mm -hmm. but who you are becoming next and, and making space for her to exist. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. I mean, I think what you do is so invaluable, you know, and how share with like how folks who might want to be able to find, I mean, we're going to post links and things, so <laughs> don't worry, but I mean, like, where can uh, folks find you, you know, if they want to set up a private session or hire you or, or whatever. Um, if they're at that point where they are ready to hire me or, or have a conversation about their space, their situation, because they're all very personal. Um, the best thing to do is actually go to peaceandprosperityalignment.com and just book a free consultation call with me. And we'll sit down and talk one-on-one -on -one about your particulars. Um, if you're not quite there yet, a lot of people, a lot of people have a lot of shame about their clutter. Um, and so, and that also goes to the conditioning, right? So it's it understanding does. the it, underlying conditioning of a culture, especially for women, right? Yes, absolutely. And so we're taught to be ashamed. It's decolonizing. Of it <laughs> it's is. Decolonizing. Absolutely. It's decolonizing the mindset is what I always say. <laughs> Yes, then that's why I call it decluttering the mindset because that's yeah. what we're doing really. And so a lot of them are still stuck in the shame and want to, and I sometimes, because I'm guilty of this, right? You know, do you ever want to clean before your housekeeper comes? <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, I- They're here they're, right now. <laughs> right, so, um, right, I'm on location in a hotel. So the housekeeper comes and I always, do the dishes first. I always clean up the kitty litter box first. There's things that I do before the housekeeper comes because the housekeeper doesn't do those things. Um, and so I want them done first so that the whole house is done when, when, when she is done. It's very similar in that people like to declutter before they call me um, because of the shame. And so if you're not at the point where or they want to see how far they can get, see if they can do it on their own until they realize they can't. <laughs> and that's fine. And that's fine. You know, that's, that's, that's sometimes that's just where people are. Um, and so if you're not quite at the making a phone call stage, but you're at the wanting to declutter stage, when you download this method at declutteryourmindset.com, you know, you're going to, it's going to put you on my email list. And so I'm going to email you with some tips and some helpful hints as to how to get you to the next step. But also you will have plenty of opportunity to be able to email me directly and just have a conversation that's not face to face, which is sometimes where people get into the struggle. They just want to be able to like send an email or, or what have you. Um, and as a last resort, you can also find me on YouTube. I put out free content every week um, to help you get started on this journey. Um, and so you can find me in any of those places, but come have a conversation because the best place to get to the next level is just to talk about it. Well, this is so enriching and thank you so much for sharing your pearls, your wisdoms, your story. And, um, I look forward to the next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on as a guest. I hope that whoever hears this gets what they need out of this conversation. I'm, I'm sure they will. <laughs> Bye. And for those, by the way, who I forgot to say, don't forget to hit the subscribe mm -hmm. button. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you get to get these every month um, and as frequently as when, when the new ones unload. So here you go. Have a great day, everybody.